So good afternoon, uh, members of the United Policyholders Wildfire Risk Reduction and Asset Protection Working Group. You are all very important in some way uh, to this endeavor. This endeavor focuses on doing everything we can uh, individually, organizationally, and collectively uh, to get as many homes as possible, as many structures as possible throughout California um, to be improved, to be hardened, to be in a better position to um, to survive wildfires, um, and then to put all the other moving parts in place so that when parcels and communities have taken steps to reduce risk, that information gets communicated to insurers through the channels that are being built as we speak um, and also get into the data sets that insurers are using, many of which now are models and risk scoring systems that determine what they are charging people. So I wanna welcome you all. I wanna call your attention uh, just briefly to the chat. We've got, uh, there's a few things in there. There's the link to today's agenda that you'll see um, to just keep us on track. And then I put two items in there before we got started um, because there have been some recent developments that I want uh, everybody uh, to be aware of. So um, I've already welcomed you. I'm gonna give you just a few of those updates. So since we last met, uh, there've been a few, a few developments. One is that the California Department of Insurance has moved to the next level of making their sustainable insurance strategy concrete, putting it into law. So a lot of the work that the, the department has been doing since they announced that strategy last year was gathering stakeholder input. They have done many different forums, public forums uh, to invite comment on the pieces of the strategy. And then they've had, I'm sure, countless meetings, private meetings with stakeholders um, including United Policyholders and many of you, uh, to try to fine tune the approach that they are taking to restore affordable, available insurance. And I actually had that reversed. I want to be clear that the department strategy is very much focused on restoring availability. And affordability is going to be something that while we have that in mind, and of course the commissioner and his team have that in mind, their strategy is let's bring insurers back first and then tackle the affordability issues even more intensively. Now that's not to say that the strategy doesn't include trying to bring premiums back down to earth. It does, uh, but it is heavily focused on restoring insurers' confidence in the regulatory environment in California, which um, is clearly a big part of the puzzle. That said, um, I think every day, in many different ways, many of us are focusing heavily on the affordability challenge. Um, part of the issue is that the FAIR plan being a high-risk concentrated pool, it's going to be more expensive to insure your property through the FAIR plan. The other problem is a lot of people are going into non-admitted uh, with non-admitted companies, the uh, excess surplus lines companies, and their rates are not um, as regulated as the traditional admitted insurers that we all know. A third reason is that even your admitted insurers have been pressuring the department heavily to grant rate increases. Um, so we're already feeling it because of those three factors. We're already seeing prices being at an all-time high for many of, of, of the people in the communities that all of you are in or serving. Um, and, and part of the strategy in trying to restore availability is, is, to, is, to, is this idea that if there are fewer people in the fair plan and fewer people in the non-admitted market and admitted insurers are getting the rate that they want, that we will see competition taming rates more as we go forward. That's the hope. Um, that's the track we're on. 
and um and and nothing is really set in stone here we are we are trying different things uh together so in the chat you'll see that the department has now taken the uh the the regulation that allows insurers to use catastrophe models in their rates um and and sending that to the office of administrative law so it becomes an official regulation. There's also something else that the commissioner did recently, um, which is to pull out put out a bulletin, which you can read, um, that sets shorter timelines uh, for rate approvals. So that he's doing by bulletin, the cap modeling and the 85%, the requirement that in return for being able to use a cap model to set your rates, you as an admitted insurance company are going to have to, within two years, satisfy the department that that you are, you have increased the number of homes in distressed areas, in a in an amount that that matches your market share in those areas. So it's a little complicated. It's got, there's some math there, but those uh, those two pieces are now on their way to becoming law. And now the department has um, invited, is, is holding a, uh, a public hearing in September uh, where they um, have are inviting comment. And I put that notice in there if your organization wants to uh, weigh in. And then uh, there, all, there's a third work stream that the department is very busy. They've, they've also they had an uh, informal uh, hearing or meeting, I guess it really meeting last week to start to hear input on the part of the sustainable insurance strategy that is allowing insurers to pass some of their reinsurance costs on to their to their policyholders, which currently is not allowed in California. And that's part of what insurers have been lobbying for. And so the department, in addition to the steps they've already taken, is starting to, to uh, hear from stakeholders. Now, if you are wondering what United Policyholders has to say about these things, you can, you can look at some of the comments we've already filed um, on the CAP model um, issue. And um, and we will be participating in that in that hearing on the 17th. The department is also inviting input on the reinsurance pass through through August 30th, but I'm not I, I'm not sure officially what channel they're looking for that type of input on. So that's all the sort of DOI updates that I wanted to share with you. Um, some great news that came out of um, our last wrap meeting that I think made a lot of us feel like uh, there's some real tangible good that we're doing through these meetings, in addition to the 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 deeper good that we're doing by helping everybody talk to each other and share information and ideas and keep each other current on on what's happening. Um, and that is that that the that one of the insurers that presented to our group CSAA has confirmed um, something that was uh, unclear at the last meeting, which is that um, if you, as you may remember, the IBHS for their wildfire prepared home designation, which is one of the ways that a property can seek a discount is to have gotten that certification, uh, that it had been previously announced that the IBHS that 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 um, I'm sorry that um, CSAA would only renew a homeowner that had achieved the the plus level of the IBHS certification. At the last meeting, there was sort of a dialogue um, behind the scenes about whether, in fact, they were going to be a little bit more generous and say it. The if you just can achieve the base level, we will renew you. Our understanding um, is that that is now their official policy, that if CSA's policy, that if you get the base level, they will renew you if you are an existing customer. Now, I've already heard from some people who say, I didn't get it. And I think because this is a new uh, a new rule that we will, and it's a large organization, that we may still be having people needing to um to to work their way into to getting that. But I do want to give CSA that shout out um, just as I thank them and Mercury for coming on um, our, our working group. And I have some invitations out to some other insurers and I'm hoping 
uh, that we we will get some more insurers participating. Because a lot of what's happening here is those of us who believe in the efficacy of of, of risk reduction um, are looking for sources of of optimism. Um, and I think um, as I get ready to introduce uh, our next our our guest speaker for today, um, I think a lot of us, in addition to feeling heartbroken uh, for for people who just lost their homes in um, the Park Fire in Butte County, as well as the Burrell Fire um, and some of the other smaller fires where homes have been lost this summer. Um, when we look for the silver lining or any kind of reason to be hopeful, because of course with Paradise um, in Butte County, that's one of the counties that is taking mitigation very seriously that has numerous programs in place. And we know that a lot of people who burned down after the campfire rebuilt resilience. So, so reading the news um, was, was, um, was, was sad on a couple levels. So I really am looking forward to hearing from our guest speaker, Jen Goodlin, who's the executive director of the Rebuild Paradise Foundation. And she's going to cover um, three topics that we asked her to hit on um, the Defensible Space Gravel Grant, and I'm not going to steal her thunder on any details there. Um, I asked her to talk about strategies to convince reluctant neighbors to create defensible space, the five foot clearance challenge. Um, and then she's going to share some impacts, reflections from the, the most recent fire. Um, so um, with that, I want to welcome you, Jen. I want to thank you uh, for giving us your time uh, and expertise today. Uh, and invite you to share your screen and start your presentation. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate you giving me this opportunity. Um, I know I've tried to say a few things and both you and Emily have helped advocate um, for us and even helped us get some funding recently, which I'll share about. So I'm going to share my screen. Good to go? Yep. Okay. So we are Rebuild Paradise Foundation, a small nonprofit in Paradise, California. Um, oops, let's see there. Um, we are just a really uh, small but mighty little team. It's myself and then I have two part-time staff, Lindsay, who's also on the call, and Stacy. Lindsay um, is my project coordinator and she has helped spearhead our defensible space program. So we are a small nonprofit that was started after the campfire in 2019 by Charles Brooks. Um, we like to give really easy resources to people rebuilding and we all live here. We're boots on the ground. We know our everyday needs. Um, just to give you, uh, everyone always asks, the first question is like, how are you guys? Um, we are doing good. <laughs> we are really coming back strong. Um, if you Google Paradise, California, um, I'm sure you're all aware we had, you know, California's worst wildfire ever. Um, the first question is, does Paradise, California still exist? And I assure you we do. Um, we are not giving up. Um, Six years later, we're still rebuilding. We have about over 2,500 newly constructed homes. Um, we have brand new schools that are filled to the max. In fact, we are trying to get a bond pass to start another elementary school because we don't have room here for all the kids and young families moving here. And we have a population over 10,000, uh, fastest growing community third year in a row in the state of California. Um, so before the fire, we were about 26,000 people after the fire about 4,000. So we're growing. Um, it just takes some time to get there. So I would say we are doing everything we possibly can to prevent what happened. Um, we are working hard, the town, the people who live here, the county, everyone. Uh, some of the things, just highlights that we have done is we have a massive tree removal program. Um, we had over 60,000 dead and dying trees removed. Um, and there's there's been much more than that. There's, we've lost about a million trees in our community. And um, these are, Paradise was able to get FEMA to step in and be create um, a program where tree removal was part of disaster recovery. That was a huge win for us. Um, we have our early warning system in place. We have 21 towers in our community alerting us when we need to evacuate. We have a pretty strict weed abatement ordinance. And what you'll see on the screen is a map of our town and all the houses in green are in compliance. 
So you see um, they're working really, really, really hard and becoming stricter on those um, lots or homes that are not taking care of the weeds. The town is taking care of them and then putting a lien on the properties. Um, obviously, because we lost all of our housing, everything being built is to WUI code. So strict standards. We don't want fire our, our homes ever catching on fire again. Um, last year, we rebuilt Paradise Foundation, helped spearhead the first spearhead the first firewise community and since then we have created 13 communities in paradise and more growing and then our recreation district is thinking outside the box and helping to create what's called a buffer zone around our canyons um, some of the really high risk areas um, to help keep them mitigated so this is uh, a much bigger project and i invite you to have our recreation district on to speak of it if you ever want to hear more about that so we're working so hard here, um, and despite all of that, our insurance rates are going up in, insanely high. Um, it is extremely frustrating, and it is suffocating our recovery. Last year, my personal policy went from $2,500 a year uh, to $12,000, and an uh, elderly neighbor uh, went from about $1,500 to $14,000. Um, I've heard policies as high as $30,000. So um, it's farmer's nice way of saying you're not dropped. You just can't afford us any longer. Um, so this, this is not just me. This is across the board happening or people are getting dropped um, when we are working so hard to, we feel like we're not at high risk. There's nothing left to burn. We're building to these high codes. We're getting wildfire prepared homes. We're doing all these things, firewoods communities. And then we just keep getting slammed by insurance. So um we just feel like we are this example community, right? We get to start from scratch. So if we can't do it, what example is that to other communities who maybe aren't getting to start from scratch? Um, insurance needs to start backing up what they're saying we should do and showing it that it's making a difference when we go to these like extreme measures. So um, Rebuild Paradise Foundation has always been like, what do we do? We want to help. Where's the need? We've we've had several grant programs. We have a master floor plan library. We give back very practically to the need in our community. So uh, last in the beginning of the year, we were like, we have to do something about insurance. This is crazy. And so like, what if we provide the resource to help people have defensible space? We're not just saying, hey, you need it. We're saying, yes, you need it, and here is a resource so you can achieve it. Um, people here are very poor and have maxed out all of their money in order to rebuild, and, and something as simple as rocks or landscaping is very hard for them to come by. Um, so we brainstormed, and we were like, what if we create, we provide rocks for them to create five feet of defensible space? Not only is this going to help with landscaping, because we have no landscaping in our community, but it'll help educate and promote the idea of five feet of defensible space. Um, so our program we released in May and it is providing 10 yards of base rock to homeowners in the campfire footprint, which is Paradise, Magalia, Concow and Butte Creek Canyon. Um, as you can see in the photo, we're promoting what CAL FIRE says is zone zero, um, the zero to five feet. And you'll see an example photo of um, rock next to a home there. So how does this work? Um, thankfully, we had two really other great grant systems that with applications um, in place before we started this. So we kind of mimicked our other very reliable process. So um, it is an application and it is actually very simple. We wanna remove all the red tape. We want everybody to have access that has a need. So. For our application, you have to live in the campfire footprint. Um, you must show photos that you need, have a need. So we require each applicant to submit four photos of their home, one showing their uh, address and the other showing each side of their home um, because some people already have defensible space or maybe they have one side or maybe it's filled with trees and you know they're not ready for gravel. So, um, you must also be the primary resident. This isn't right now because of funding, this isn't for renters um, or contractors building. So, and then you have at least 75% of the home must be gravel ready. 
Um, in our community, that's pretty simple. Most homes are brand new and have no landscaping. But this is also for homeowners whose home survived the campfire. We wanted to um, extend that for them. And so we don't want to be giving gravel to people who maybe have a lot of landscaping around that uh, zone zero. So they are required that 75% is gravel ready. Um, so each application uh, Lindsay takes, makes through, it's vet, makes sure it's vetted, has everything it needs. And once a month, she takes it to our grant review committee. They overlook each application. They are an outside source. They, they look at everything fairly and they determine a need um, and base um, the gravel voucher amount on the homeowner's needs. So the gravel vouchers are between two to $500. So in our community, $500 covers 10 yards of base rock. And that is enough for a 2000 square foot home to have five feet of defensible space. Um, that is larger than our average sized home. We wanted to be generous. So let's go more. We always try to go on the side of generosity if a little bit more than what someone would need. Um, we are working with a local rock yard called North State Aggregate. So we are helping a local business, which is also very important to our foundation. And uh, we partner with them. Um, once an applicant has been, um, application has been accepted by our grant review committee, we uh, then release vouchers um, that they, that I mail and then they turn into North State Aggregate. So once they redeem the voucher, uh, delivery fees are included and I pick up the vouchers once a week and I write a check to North State Aggregate. So that's kind of our system of helping promote, um, we're trying to promote defensible space while creating the resource, um, but this is also a very highly educational grant because a lot of people don't even know that they need to do this um, until insurers are starting to tell them they have to. So um, there's a lot of moving parts to this, right? Because it's not just providing a resource. We're telling people this is important for the protection of your home. And then a neighbor tells a neighbor, it's a big part of our FireWise communities, this resource is. Um, one thing we did not realize when we released this grant is that almost simultaneously insurers in our community were starting to require it. So, um, when you have a resource and insurance is saying you have to do this, you become very busy. <laughs> so, okay, these are, I wanna show you some of the photos of our applicants. What, what you're seeing here is very real to our community. Um, that blue house on the upper left, you can see they actually removed some of their grass in order to create five feet of dispensable space. So showing you could still have grass, landscaping. Uh, the other three photos are, very, very typical for our community. Um, you can you can see we don't have a lot of trees. Um, it's just the weeds. We're dealing with a lot of weeds. Um, actually, the rocks are going to enhance the view, like what people's homes even look like on the outside. So um, yeah, this is a lot. I mean, some of these are very nice homes and they cannot afford to landscape. So we launched this grant uh, May 6th of this year. Uh, we have been slammed. We had over 200 applications. Um, so thankful for Lindsay for just, she's a part-time and she's just been inundated um, dealing with all of this. So since then we've awarded 142 vouchers and we've had 65 vouchers redeemed. We keep a pretty um, strict spreadsheet to keep track of all of this so we know who's applied, who's awarded, uh, if their voucher was turned in, gravel was delivered, and then now we're starting to track uh, different things like photos and components of if the gravel was placed in that five foot defensible space zone. So um, on the next photo, you'll see, this is one of our applicants before and after photos. Uh, she just had some nice red dirt, which is highly prone to getting weeds, and now she has gravel. So. The hardest part of this program and the question we get asked the most is how do we ensure the gravel is being placed appropriately? Um, we're working hard, but there's no 100% guarantee. But what what one thing we're doing is random audits. So drive-bys in the community once someone has received their gravel and we feel like adequate time for spreading. Um, we do have very 
a lot of people who are physically unable to spread the gravel. So we have vol partnered with volunteer groups to help them spread, which ensures that it's spread in that zone. And then we also are incentivizing people by, if you show us a photo, we'll put you in a drawing for a tree um, because people really love trees here and they love the opportunity for trees, just not in that zero to five foot zone. And then now what we didn't realize is the insurer is actually partnering in our guarantee because they are requiring it. So when we have a resident come in with a letter from their insurer saying, you must have a wildfire prepared home, we give them a grant, we know what they're using that gravel for, right? Because they're that's what they need it for. Um, so those are kind of the ways we're, we're tracking this. Even if gravel is misplaced in our community, it is still helping reduce weed growth. So, you know, some people might end up with ex excess, excess, where we say, use it as you please. Um, they are actually allowed to get any gravel they choose and pay additional amount if they so choose. So we've seen many applicants pay $1,000 for gravel. They just have help with a $500. So, um, we just want people who are trying to educate, promote, and create a resource. And um, it has been, I think this is one thing our foundation is doing that's not just an idea for our community, but we're super hopeful others can mimic. Um, if we're seeing, you know, this make a difference, like other communities can do this. We've had an applicant from San Francisco wondering why they couldn't get our grant. And so we know that other people need it. They were dropped from their insurer and they were just looking for anything. Um, this is also like a ripple effect, right? $500 isn't very much money, um, but over time, the cost savings for insur insurability and maybe even the cost of insurance is really what we're looking at is the long-term savings for somebody. So um, fi that $500 really multiplies huge. Uh, our other grant programs were much larger award amounts. And this one just, I, a yeah, the $500 can go a million ways. So our biggest hurdle though has been funding because this we're six years after our fire, there's been new fires, um, it's a new idea. Um, there is lots of money for very large defensible space projects that, that are more um, like forest driven, but for the resident, um, it's a harder sell um, to get people to kind of buy into this idea. So. We have had several funding partners. All of them are, are pretty small amounts, but we are grateful. You know, every, every penny helps us in this program. So as you can see, um, our funders listed there, um, one of them, AAA, uh, was on a call a few months back and they were talking about trying to help rural communities like ours. And we were able to have a meeting after and they gave a, a generous donation to our foundation for this program. So I really love they were backing up the words um, that they were saying they wanted to help and promote this. So um, I feel like that's the, for, you know, getting one insurer will hopefully create more insurers to give us funding in the future. Um, Amy, do you want me to stop there on questions on the gravel grant program before we talk about other things? Yeah, if there are any questions about the gravel grant program from our participants, you're welcome to either raise your hand or put them in the chat. I prefer the chat, um, uh, but if you if that's because it's hard for me to see everybody's hands up. Okay. Can you see some of the is there questions? I do not see any. I see a comment. Um, <clears throat> rock is difficult to maintain since weeds grow into it and can be easily removed with a shovel. Weed cloth, it's an opinion. It's not really a question. Underneath can help for a while. Which tends to bare earth, in my opinion, would be a better choice. Here's one. Um, do you work with any Fire Safe Council or RCD? Yes, we work with Butte Fire Safe Council. They're a big partner with us. Um, we worked a lot with them. We uh, since we spearheaded the first Firewise communities, and they are really taking the ball on that. But we are a big resource for the Firewise communities um, with our gravel grant. Their director has even utilized our gravel grant. So um, yes, we do. And we've sought to see if they have any whole, like access to funding for us. But once again, it's for those bigger mitigation projects and not residential. Okay. 
I mean, it's it's very. Um, I every time I say this, I it grown concrete. Um, <clears throat> what you're doing, and you know, it's very. Um, yeah, it's a great program. Uh, I do not see other questions. So if you want to move on to the um, to the strategies to convince reluctant neighbors. So one of our strategies. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I, I'm so sorry. We do have one. That's OK. Um, uh, first, are you having a membrane placed under the rock to, re to reduce weed growth? And second, do you have a size of the gravel requirement so a leaf blower does not blow the gravel around? So those are, are just suggestions for people. Um, one of the reasons base rock is a good choice and why we suggest it is because it's, you know, those small triangles that really fit together versus like a round gravel that help prevent some of those things. I can assure you, I have base rock around my house that if you grow a weed in it, it's 10 times easier to pull out than our hard red dirt. Um, I know, you know, bare earth for us is not a better option because of our insane growing climate. Um, you, it is just a matter of time before you have really big weeds next to your house or tall grasses. Um, so yes, we do. When we have a volunteer group come, mm -hmm. the idea will be that they're gravel ready, even as far as having a weed cloth down so that we're helping give them a better long-term solution. Um, but yeah, great question. Okay, thank you so much, Jen. Um, oh, another one. Are concrete or pavers acceptable? That's really more, I think I'd say, a question for um uh for somebody who's who's doing an all-purpose clear space program. But are you do you want to you can address that if you want to? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So the idea is we're promoting defensible space. So whatever that looks like for the person, a lot of people are using a combination. So they may have pavers. And then they're filling in with rock because now they have access. We actually don't have an income limitation on this grant. Um, it's different from our others because we're trying to promote a safe community. And if you, in our community, you can have someone, you know, middle income, higher income next to someone who's poor. And we just really want to educate and promote the idea of defensible space versus, oh, you make too much. Yeah. That person is just as deserving. They might be able to afford it a little bit more, but that's not the, the long-term goals really for a community safe space, because that is what insurance keeps telling us. They're like me as an individual, I can do what I want, but if my neighbor doesn't, that's the problem. Right. So right. that's where this is the idea of we're not putting an income limit on this. Yeah, that's, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned it. I know that's a, that's um, an issue a lot of communities are struggling with is it's trying to do a needs assess, you know, needs, ba you know, income based assessment is a whole nother level of challenge. Um, so that I think, you know, that makes a lot of sense to just not have to have that in the mix. Um, is there a county ordinance for this requirement? The town has an ordinance, um, but the compliance doesn't mean it's being complied with. <laughs> so yeah, the town has an ordinance for this. Yeah. Okay. But our grant goes beyond the town limits. It's also for some surrounding areas that were affected by the campfire. Gotcha. Okay. So let's talk about reluctant neighbors. <laughs> so I, it's just, we're such a unique community, right? We're starting from ground zero. This is where we're trying to like nip the idea in the bud before people start planning beautiful things right next to their house. Um, we're too late on some regard, or if people have something that survived the campfire that's near their home, um, usually the response is I'll remove that over my dead body. Um, so where the compliance is really coming from is the insurer requiring it. Um, that's just, you know, we are going to be a community primarily almost entirely on the fair plan and or non-insured. We have a lot of uninsured people here because what's happening with the rates. So when people realize like, I can't, I won't be insured unless I do this, that's really what's changing the reluctant neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing changing the reluctant neighbor, honestly, is having a resource. Like you could tell someone over and over what to do, right? Like you need this, you need defensible space, you need, you need, but and when you say you need it, and also here is something you can use it, be, it reduces that um, hesitation, right? Or or barrier, I would say, in a sense. So 
yeah, they, they partner with each other. There are some people I will never convince, um, and that's okay. But the idea is, you know, that one more person or that, that neighbor, um, yeah, it's, it, if you haven't, you know, been so impacted by fire, it's a little harder. Like my own, my own parents, they live in Placerville and they can't remove any more trees because they're on such a sloped lot that their house would slide down the hill. So it's just such a balance. And I don't know the perfect balance of, you know, defensible space, but also maintaining the beauty. <laughs> I know it can be achieved though. Yeah, I mean, from the very beginning um, of of me launching this working group and 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 you know chairing these meetings, you'll have heard me say many times that a lot of this is about not making the perfect be the enemy of the good. Because just like you know, IBHS will say, well, you know, it's five feet nothing. There will be um, there will be people on the other side saying some succulents are okay. Just like uh, we have had, we know the five foot of clearance is, is in effect, um, but it's, there's sporadic enforcement. I think that is what recognizes that we're, um, we're trying to do what we can. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yes, reluctant neighbors, ongoing, uh, yeah. ongoing challenge. And it's always yeah. interesting. Yeah. I've, we also I've, have a very unique community because so many people now we're at this place where 50% of the people um, who live here now did not live here during the fire. So may, they don't have the same like knowledge or understanding of the maybe importance. Some do, um, but then trying to educate this new, this new group of people who's coming here, that's one of the jobs of this grant is yeah. to simply inform. Okay. Um, so then let's get to the recent fire impacts. Uh, yeah, so um, the park fire is actually just across the ridge from Paradise. And um, it's actually almost contained, uh, not fully yet, but um, it did threaten our community, I would say, for a hot a couple of days. And you'll get um, a number of responses, right? Uh, from you know the the trauma trigger, the idea of evacuating, um, our whole town did have an evacuation warning. Uh, it was not mandatory, um, but I you know our community has also been preparing for over five years to not have this happen. Mm -hmm. So we are creating defensible space, um, and I can only speak for myself personally, but I didn't feel threatened because I have prepared my home and my family um, from this event, anything like that happening again. So there was almost like a different calm or peace, um, but also recognizing the tragedy across the ridge, right? There are uh, four families who lost homes in the campfire, who lost homes in the park fire. So obviously that's extremely, you know, traumatic and hard and um, it also is a reminder of our why. Why are we working so hard here? You can see on the screen, um, one of our gravel grant recipients said, I want to thank you for the $350 voucher. I'm waiting for the weather to cool a bit before I pursue this. In light of the park fire, anything we can do to make our home safe is well appreciated. Um, so just that like, okay, we, we not only don't want this to happen here, we actually don't want it to happen for others. We don't want to see others go through that. Okay. Um, I am not seeing questions. If there are more questions for Jen, you can put them in the chat. I, I see some good comments and shares um, on weeds um, and the, the value of education. We see Chief Tyler um, reminding us about an upcoming event um, that that he has been organizing for several years that we participate in. That's a really wonderful event. Heather, it looks like you've got uh, your hand raised and I actually see it. Um, so so fire away, as it were. Except oh, you're on mute. You're muted. All right, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Hi, I'm Heather McCauley. I am the Deputy Chief for Wildfire Preparedness. I am in charge of defensible space, home hardening, 
um, burn permits and the damage assessment program. And I just want to commend you on what you're doing. Zone zero is so very important to uh, defensible space. And what you're doing is exactly what we are teaching our DSIs. Um, I oversee it, defensible space for the whole state. And um, I just want to commend you. And I'd really like to talk to you offline about all the uh, stuff you're doing. I was just on the park fire for the um, damage inspection. I was the, the damage inspection manager. And so um, I really like to talk to you about that fire as well. And um, yeah, I just so happy I was on, be able to be on this call today to uh, hear your presentation. So thank you very much for what you're doing. You're making it easier for us. I do work with the folks in, um, Paradise for Cal Fire. We've uh, helped you guys with your defensible space and um, showing your neighbors, everyone that's doing the, um, you know, being compliant and ones that aren't being compliant. I know that was really important to get everybody on board. I know um, exactly what you mean. I hear the pitfalls all the time about um, folks that don't want to do it. And um, you're just a really good advocate for that. And I just really appreciate all your hard work. And, and, you know, Heather, right back at you, we, you know, Cal Fire, I mean, from being in the trenches all over the state uh, to to trying to be polite in delivering information that, you know, is in people's best interests. Right. You know that it's their asset and, and you know, you're you're trying to help them prevent it from being damaged or destroyed. And, and um, people aren't always as as polite as the, in return as they should be. Um, so we. Right. Appreciate you, and it, you know we would be happy to have you um, be a presenter at a future meeting. Uh, I had actually checked in with with Chief Berlant, and um, and so you know if it's if, if if there are statewide initiatives that that our uh, working group would benefit from hearing about, we would welcome you um, to to at a future um, one of these meetings. Uh, Absolutely, we have a... I have uh, I have panel in the chat. I'm sorry. Can you put your email in the chat? Absolutely. I also have uh, my home hardening assistant chief, uh, Chief Dennis O'Neill is on this call as well. He's working hard in other communities to um, get homes hardened. That's another program we use. And also uh, retired chief um, Steve Hawks. I, I was looking at everybody's names to see what other uh, Cal Fire folks are on here. And Chief Hawks is heavily into the IBHS homes. So uh, you definitely have a lot of support. And I know they're as excited about this program as I am. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and you know, Chief Tyler in Novato um, put, a, put a very timely comment in there about Zone Zero. Um, it, you know, we're, we're still, believe it or not, even though many of you have been working on this for so long, still kind of early in shaping the public's understanding about it and recognition and um, and then the curb appeal piece of like, is my house still going to look attractive is, you know, we learned a lot about that from um, advocate help, helping people in flood regions when they were told to elevate and they thought how hideous it was going to make their house. And then we just had to have some good demonstration um, <clears throat> uh, pictures and of, of, of how you can do it. And then, of course, I think we talked about um, at the last meeting, we talked about the um, the landscape design contest that um, CSAA part participated in or supported and uh, along with Chief Tyler and a number of other folks, I don't know if Chief Hawks might have been on there as well, um, to to model attractive looking homes um, with a, you know, with a good clean zone zero. So we're, we'll, we'll be getting there. It's just going to continue to take some pain in the process, I think, um, as people just start to adapt um, their understanding. We also had a, <clears throat> so oh, Rosemary got her question answered, um, but that's a perfect segue um, into an announcement I wanted to make. Um, but I do want to thank you, Jen, uh, for everything you're doing and for that um, excellent presentation uh, and for your time. And you're, you're obviously, you have a lot of good energy that you're bringing. So thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share. I appreciate it. And actually one of our volunteers, one of United Policyholders volunteers that 
shows up at events for us um, is one of those people that lost a, lost his home in a campfire, used our roadmap to recovery resources to get back on his feet and then lost his home again. Um, it's a tough one. I do want to remind folks we we have brought our roadmap to recovery program uh, to the areas that are have recently been burned. We're going to be doing an orientation um, on September 12th and can put that in the chat. So if you if you know anybody who has um, lost a home recently in one of the fires, we're going to let them know about this free webinar we'll be offering where we just walk people through best practices getting out of the gate uh, when you've been impacted by a wildfire and resources um, that are there to help you and our programming and, and what you can access through us. So um, Rosemary Smallcomb is on. She is a supervisor down in Mariposa County. Um, and uh, I wanted, is a perfect segue to let everybody know, we don't usually pitch. This is a group of hardworking, a lot of you are volunteers in the first place. Um, so we don't normally ask um, people to participate in one of our fundraisers, but we do have two coming up. Uh, we have our Up to Good Live coming up September 20th at uh, the Deloche Vineyards up in Santa Rosa. And we can put the information in there. You'd be welcome. I think, Jen, you said you're going to be coming. And um, and previous at previous Up to Goods, we have presented awards to some of our working group members, Bill Tyler, Paul Lowenthal up in Santa Rosa with Santa Rosa Fire, um, Bill Tyler with Novato Fire. Um, and this year, we're going to be presenting an award to Rosemary Smallcomb, Supervisor Smallcomb, because literally it's because of her that we are all here. Um, and it was really, it was her uh, asking me whether United Policyholders could pick up the mantle um, from the the Placer County gentleman who was running a similar group um, and retired to enjoy his grandkids. And I said, definitely. And that led to um, this group being um, being started and all the good work that we've been doing together now for low these many years. So Supervisor Smallcomb toils away in a very beautiful but vulnerable to wildfires region. And we will be giving her an award um, at our event September 20th. Uh, we will also be giving an award uh, to one of our own, Annie Barber, who um, is on this call. You may have seen her. She is she's classic team up person. You might see her at a preparedness event. You might see her at a recovery event. So uh, she was at our table for the park fire um, earlier uh, this month, and um, she's in the trenches as a, as a hero. So we'll be honoring Rosemary. Is there any, Rosemary and Annie on the 20th? Um, and then for those of you who like wine in October, um, you can buy a ticket uh, October 30th. We're doing a virtual online guided wine tasting. And what I like about it is that it's, uh, we got a really great deal from the winery. So the three bottles um, that you get with your ticket um, you're actually getting them at a great deal um, and you actually get something for your donation and and support us. And it's something you can do from the comfort of your own home. So um, we'll put those those links in there. And again, no pressure. You know, a lot of you, like I said, we know you're, you're not in a position to be throwing money around, but we do um, consider you part of the family and we would welcome you to participate in either of these events. Rosemary, is there anything you want to brief us on about your recent fires down there? Well, golly, um, we're still recovering from <laughs> the fire in July of 2022. Um, but I do want to say, and um, Amy, it's just you've taken this so far and Department of Insurance is doing so much, I think, um, thanks to your leadership. And I'm really excited. We're going to be meeting. I'm serving on an insurance uh working group within the California State Association of Counties, as you well know, because you presented at the last meeting, um, but we're gonna be meeting with Commissioner Lara uh, later this week. And um, and I, I just, we've come so far from where we were um, and I actually have a lot of hope about how the advances that we can make, um, given your leadership, um, Commissioner Lara's leadership and that of others, in communities around the state. Thank you so much, Rosemary. We look forward to raising a glass with you and to you. 
um, and and the many others um, who will be there to to um, to to help us keep pulling in the right direction. You know, if there were easy answers here, uh, we wouldn't be where we are. You know, these are these are very nuanced, complicated situations. One other thing um, before I go into the final bit, um, actually two things. Um, we still have our survey open, our California Home Insurance Survey. We're going to have it open through the end of the year. We would love to get our numbers up even more. Um, this is where we're just asking people to tell us what's going on. You know, who did you get non-renewed? Um, who were you able to find coverage with? What happened to your premium with the renewal policy? Um, did your insurer at, ask you to do specific things? Um, did they, are you getting any kind of a discount? Um, and then on the topic of discounts, um, the, uh, we did one of our home insurance shopping help webinars most recently in June, and we did, um, walk through the new fair plan, um, discounts that you can get up to 15%, um, for home hardening and improving your structure, improving the surroundings. Um, I have no doubt that there are some of you who've tried um, to get that discount and, and are um, encountering some maybe paperwork obstacles, delays, confusion as to who who you even can go to. Um, and we will, hope, we will hope the FAIR plan continues to staff up and be able to um, give better service. We know that, that they have been struggling in that regard and with the dramatically increased um, flow of, of applications and requests. And, and now they're going to have <clears throat> quite a few claims coming in, I'm sure, from the most recent fires. So um, so the survey, the Shopping Hub webinar is on our website. Um, you can watch it or send the link to folks. I talked about the events. Last little piece. Um, M, do we have, a, do we have a, a date for the September meeting? I think we were looking at the 24th. Is that a definite it's not a definite yet. We're still waiting to see if that date works for um for our speaker, which was, we were planning on having someone from Wildfire Prepared Home come to give us an update. So that um actually, as you guys and gals will know, we had IBHS on right after they unrolled um the Wildfire Prepared Home uh, uh, program. And now I asked them to come back because uh, they are <clears throat> unrolling a related program, the Wildfire Prepared Neighborhood, which addresses insurers' concerns and public safety experts' concerns that great if you improve one home, but if the neighbor doesn't do anything, you really haven't moved the needle. We need to see widespread adoption. Um, so we'll that's that's the topic we're aiming at the next meeting. Um, last little piece of housekeeping. Um, Michelle Steinberg with the Firewise um community program, which is under NHPA. Um, she was a planner. We had her present um, some, some time back. You and she off. reached out to me. Um, Susan, can you mute? Thanks. Um, we, she had reached out. Um, I'm sorry, I got off track here. So you all know Firewise is really important, being a Firewise community, because that is one of the indicia that insurers feel is meaningful in addition to IBHS certification. Um, and so for, but for Firewise, um, and that was the trigger for USAA to give, and still I think is to give some automatic discounts. You have to be in a Firewise community to get it. Okay. So we had Susan come on. She talked to us. I'm sorry, Michelle, come on. She talked to us and um, she reached out to me recently to say with the increased, with all the non-renewals and people looking for a strategy, how do I get back in my insurer's good graces? Um, they are getting a lot more uh, applications from communities to become Firewise. They're keeping up with those applications, but, they, but they've but they been also getting some people who are uh, upset with them because they're saying, um, we, we did our, um, we did our mitigations and it doesn't seem to be getting reflected in, in, in our insurance rates. And what she wanted me to convey to all of you, and she's going to be putting out a notice, is that, that Firewise only provides data on, the, on their participating communities to 
the data vendors that then report that to insurers, they only do it twice a year. So there's a lag. So keep applying for the, the, the FireWise designation as you have been, if you haven't already, get your applications in, but understand that there's going to be um, a, a time lag before that information gets to the insurers. That's number one. And number two is she asked me to convey that they are trying to, um, to report in, in shorter intervals so that three months or so instead of six months so that the mitigations that are getting completed in Firewise communities are getting reported to data vendors who then report to the insurers. Um, okay, so um, we've got we've got uh, that's pretty much the program, uh, and now we're going to move into some a, a different part. And I'm going to um, well, first I want to thank my team as I always do for um, helping put together today's meeting. I want to thank all of you who took the time to participate. I want to thank Jen again. Um, Supervisor Smallcom uh, for joining us. Uh, and then um, everybody who's in this, on this journey with us. Um, there's just so many moving parts. Keep up the great work, keep the faith. Um, we I share uh, Supervisor Smallcom's optimism um, that together we're gonna reduce risk um, at scale uh, and uh, bring back uh, a healthier insurance market as well as healthier communities um, as we go forward. So, um, Em, you wanna, you wanna, we can, um, I can do my, that's a wrap. Um, we can stop the recording and 